evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, postgraduate teaching program as part of the monthly clinical meeting of Sagar Hospitals, Jainagar. Um, Dr. Lakshman doesn't need any introduction to anybody, but the thing that I need to sort of say is anything that comes new on the horizon. Um, so Dr. Lakshman is one of the first to explore, understand, and then you know, imp implement it in his practice. Artificial intelligence is one such thing which is making waves in the you know, across all fields, and obviously it is also um, you know, coming into medicine probably in a big way shortly. So Dr. Lakshman is going to give us a flavor about what artificial intelligence is and what is its current uh, role in surgical practice and what what does the future hold for us. Over to Dr. Lakshman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ravi, and a good evening to all of you. Uh, Ravi hit the nail on the head when he said that I can give you a flavor. In the 15 minutes that I have, uh, I can only give you a very brief overview of what artificial intelligence is and where we're going with it. So I will be touching, as I said, very superficially and very broadly on what AI is, what its applications in surgery are, its advantages, and above all, something that we all should be very aware of, its pitfalls, its disadvantages. And that is something which I would actually stress on. To understand what artificial intelligence is, we must know what human intelligence is. We sort of take it for granted, you know, until I started reading about artificial intelligence a few years ago, I really didn't have an idea what human intelligence was. Basically, as defined in this paper, human intelligence is the capacity for reasoning. You can, you can get facts, imbibe inputs, verbal, auditory, pictorial, whatever, and store those facts as memory and then reason with those facts that you have in memory and problem solve. Right? We, in life we feel, feel, you know, we face so many issues and with all these inputs sitting in our memory, we solve problems and that is human intelligence. Earlier it used to be a part of the so-called amygdala. Some of people thought long ago, but now it is known that it is the frontoparietal cortex that holds the memory and has the capacity to reason and solve problems. Machines do it now. That is artificial intelligence. Right? And so by definition, if something can function and effectively undertake cognitive functions, such as problem solving, object and word recognition, for example, pictures and words and text, that is artificial intelligence. It has not been very new. In fact, chat GPT came last November and everything has become you know, very hectic after that, but it has been there for a long time. We have seen simple word suggestions in Gmail. When you use your Gmail and type something, it says, it gives you an automatic, suggests an automatic answer, it completes your sentences for you. All that is art artificial intelligence. Chatbots, you know, you ask for a service of your computer or your phone, you, you think that at the other end there is another human being answering, you know it isn't, it's a computer which is answering. It has set patterns and set uh, protocols which it can answer you with. Collision avoidance system. My XUV700 has a collision avoidance system. It has inputs from sensors and it will not let me hit something. Even if I'm accelerating, the car will stop. So you can afford to fall asleep at the wheel with an XUV700, which you can't do with other cars, for example. And self-driving cars are the highest. We now recognize five levels of artificial intelligence in automation. XUV700 is at level three. And a self-driving car which needs no driver, starts by itself, stops by itself, that is level five, the highest level of uh, a self-driving, automatic, artificially AI-driven vehicle. So what is it made of? Basically, it's artificial intelligence is made of a set of hardware and software protocols which are basically mathematical models. They're basically, you know, that's what we have to understand. All computers are mathematics driven. So then those, the software is mathematics driven and it has a set of protocols or the code that we have. And it is done through this hidden thing called machine learning. You will find that I'll be talking about 
jargon that they use in artificial intelligence. Machine learning is one such jargon. What it means is that apart from taking inputs and holding it in memory, it can make predictions about because through the, through the algorithms again. So if you give it a set of data, for example, it will tell you whether this particular patient in an ICU is going to have an arrest or not, is going to get better or not. Sepsis, is he going to get better? You know, these are all you know, deductions or predictions based on certain mathematical models. And that's what a computer does best. Deep learning is a part of machine learning. It's a subset of machine learning. And what is machine learning itself? It can recognize patterns. That's the main thing about machine learning. It can recognize patterns. Earlier, it, it was if you have a database, for example, it could only handle set words and set phrases. Today, machines now can read flowing text. And they can get information even from a written text, a paragraph or a speech or whatever. It doesn't depend on structured data inputs. It can, it can be unstructured. They can still glean the information and store the data. And the way it does it is, as I said, it can read the text. What does that necessarily mean? It means natural language processing. That's what they call it in computer lingo. NLP, it goes beyond text. How is it beyond the text? It can recognize and understand context. Okay, It's not just a set of words for it. If you have the same set of words in two different contexts, which we all almost always do in our day-to-day -day practice, computers now have the capacity and the algorithm or the software to recognize patterns and contexts of words. And that is the important thing. How does it do it? The hardware part of it is called an artificial neural network. What it means is it has uh, several layers of interconnected chips or memory cells, several layers which connect with each other. And so these layers of memory cells are programmed by the AI programmer to talk to each other. These memory cells hold the memory for everything. As I said, just like in a human brain, they have to hold data. And the data is then gleaned as is required through these several layers and it can then understand and give you output in the form of predictions. It can give you uh, output in the form of text. And now it can even give you output in the form of pictures. Okay, you must have seen things in, uh, in WhatsApp where, you know, it's as if some world leader is giving a talk which is not given at all. It's just that somebody else's talk is integrated with this person's visual images. The lip movements are synced. The whole jing bang lot is done only through this. I'm sorry about this. I thought I had stopped it. Sorry, my apologies. I put it on mute. Didn't work. Yeah, sorry. So the whole thing is done by these cells. And the highest form of that recognition, which is still in its infancy, but it's going to you know, advance by leaps and bounds, is computer vision, where it can recognize still and video images. And it's not as well advanced as recognition of text, but that's what's going to happen in the next few years. We, all of us have heard of ChatGPT, and that is based on what's called a large language module. It essentially means that it is trained to evaluate large masses of data. For example, ChatGPT is fed with information from the internet up to end 2022. You can imagine the you know, trillions of bytes of data that this program can handle, which essentially means that you need to have with them, with their servers, huge servers with very big speeds and big capacities. It's called mining large data. Data mining, it is called, it takes data from various parts of the internet and it holds on to it and processes it, large language model. The other two things that you need to know, which is of relevance of AI in medicine, is virtual reality and augmented reality. Virtual reality is a situation where the whole picture that you see is completely generated by the computer. Our VR trainers are a classic example. Augmented reality is where a normal physical picture, like a CT scan or an MRI is taken, and the computer adds to it through its AI program. Where, does, where is it helpful? Helpful in planning operations, particularly neurosurgery as of today. It will be of help in all walks of life, in all branches of surgery. So you can augment a real reality, which is a CT scan or, a, or an MRI, for example, with 
computer aided images and it gives you a very realistic picture of what the inside is like and that helps the surgeon practice his operation before he actually undertakes the operation on the patient so this is here and now it's not something for the future people are actually doing it so coming to the nitty gritty of where ai is applicable in surgery it has these six basic tenets clinical decision support where it helps a clinician make decisions robotic surgery is very heavy in ai i'll talk about each of these as we go along ar and vr integration very useful in planning surgery and in surgical training training is such an important part of surgery it's becoming more and more difficult and so with ar and vr we can make it a lot more realistic for our trainees monitoring and predictive analysis predictions are everything today you have all these so many scores in so many fields of surgery the q so far you name it any number of scores for diagnosis as well as outcomes in sepsis in post op care and things like that so all these you know pawan is going to talk about news there is a score for that every single thing has a score and how can us how can we remember those things as humans but computers can so all you have to do is if you have an ai enabled system in your icu or in your ward or the ot you can feed the data into it it will actually it feed itself through the lab directly even you don't have to feed it in and it can give you a predictive model so that is not too far away and certain centers are actually doing it i already mentioned about surgical training and scientific writing is a talk by itself i can only just mention about it clinical decision support is an important thing where does it help you you know our mind can hold certain things certain data that we have but we invariably you know we go by the tenet that a rare diagnosis is rarely correct so most of us are trained to making common diagnosis but there may be an occasional patient where it's a very rare possibility which you forget in your differential diagnosis but an ai assisted system can not only give you the normal common you know common diagnosis it can also pop up and tell you look it could be this look in look into it a rare diagnosis so these little small percentages no doubt the small percentage of patients where you may not have thought of a rare condition ai can help you do that that's what i mean mean when i say think about unusual differential diagnosis but there's a big caveat there's a big limitation what is it the output from ai is dependent purely on the inputs it, for all computers gibberish nonsense in gibberish nonsense out so let us not forget that so if as a doctor you give it wrong inputs as far as the clinical history is concerned or physical examination is concerned invariably you'll get a wrong set of diagnosis the other important thing is it depends on pathognomonic test we know that everything is not black and white in medicine everything your lab tests your x ray diagnosis your ultrasound nothing is black and white there is a gray and as of now ai cannot account for that gray it it can only see most of it as black and white and can go a little off the line in that situation robotic surgery is out and out ai because the movement that is controlled that is stabilized and i know that is made effective is only through object recognition and inputs spatial inputs you know the, the computer can read exactly which point in that space the tip is on a on a real time basis with great precision it can move and compensate and one of the best areas where ai comes in handy is when it takes away the tremor of the surgeon even if there's a tremor on the surgeon if the thing shakes because of the spatial recognition by the ai driven machine it can take away the tremor that's a very important part and as i said ar and vr can give you enhanced experience of the anatomy you have an ar for example a ct scan may be made to look with the augmented reality as the real real object be it the pancreas or whatever where any organ or the brain or whatever so ar is going is taking a very big role in terms so as i said of operative planning and practice sessions before actually doing the operation early monitoring is something which is already in action in many hospitals and which is very very useful later in the day you're going to hear about news where we are we have looked at the monitoring of patients in the ward which tells you whom you should shift to 
uh, and I see you quickly, for example, in a post-op phase. I'm giving you a very classic, common example. And an AI-driven system can do it even faster. And today, it doesn't even depend on the inputs by the treating doctor or the nurse. There are wearables. You can have little bracelets, anklets, perhaps just a head ring or whatever. That gives them the vitals, the oxygen, the pulse, the BP, the rhythm of the ECG. Everything can be automatically fed into the system and it can warn you hours before you actually realize that a patient is potentially going into trouble. Training conundrum is something we all know, all of you know. We have very little time for our students. If you have a busy clinical schedule, lots of the government has gone and increased the PG strength by a factor of 100 percent, fewer and fewer patients because they are divided among very, very many new colleges and hospitals and you are always worried about the medical legal implications of a trainee doing an operation. So how, what is the solution for it? AR and VR driven training. Today many hospitals, uh, many training centers uh, in Bangalore, in, in the state and elsewhere in the country have these very realistic looking we are trainers where you can practice not only basic surgical skills but also full operations. You can practice a cholese laparoscopic cholecystectomy, a laparoscopic appendicectomy, a hemicolectomy, and a whole lot of it, and endoscopies. You have VR trainers for all of them and that's a very realistic and a very good method of training. What it does is that the consultant who is training you, your trainer, has two big advantages. When you learned it on, in the lab first, he knows that you can, you have a basic understanding of the whole thing so he can give you more to do. So you'll do bigger and better things faster. And the speed is of importance because as you know, one can ill afford to have a trainee fiddle around with a patient for hours together for basic surgical movements. So when you have the hang of these basic surgical movements, then the trainer will be more confident in giving you more and more to do in the operating room. So that is an advantage of bench training or lab training and particularly when it is VR driven. Publication is something I'm going to talk very little about because I would like to have some time for discussion on the topic and comments from the seniors here. The whole aspect of chat GPT and, pub and, and, the, AI, and, and the AI driven text generation has put the surgical and medical publication in huge turmoil. Nobody knows what to do with it. There are no rules as such and there are papers, I'm sure most of you would have seen it, where two very dangerous things have happened. One, a completely AI generated fictional paper has been accepted and published in journals. Peer reviewed, okay, specialists, I'm a peer reviewer and I'm terribly nervous now when I get a paper for review because I don't know how much of it is chat GPT. It's a very serious problem. So peer reviewed and they have done a study which shows that 60% of fake AI driven manuscripts are missed by experienced peer reviewers. They cannot even detect that it is fiction. So what, what, where does it leave medical publishing? particularly when these pressures of people having to publish, you know, to get their promotions and things like that. That's a huge problem. Second, there is this concept of artificial AI hallucination. See, unlike human beings, at least the good, transparent, decent human beings who say that I don't know when they don't know something, AI doesn't do that. It will put something out. And its, its inputs are completely crazy. A, AI chat, you know, the chat GPT, for example, has inputs only up to 2022. It has no more, it has no information for the whole of 2023. That's a relatively limited limitation, Le relatively small limitation. The much bigger limitation is it just scans the internet. We know that a lot of internet has no evidence for what it says. Any individual can put anything on the internet. It's not peer reviewed. It has no controls. So this, and AI is not, is not designed to select out only evidence-based articles. And third, a big limitation is that most conventional medical publishers, where we depend on, on whom we depend for our journals, have not allowed 
these AI bodies to read those journals. For example, it will not be able to glean some information from British Journal of Surgery or, uh, you know, whatever, surgery, journal surgery from United States or whatever well-recognized evidence-based journals. It need not necessarily have information from that. It only, some, some of those articles are free. Of course, this will, this will read those, but not all of them. And it's not the latest. So these are big limitations. And the other big consideration we have is about patient confidentiality, which is a, a pillar of uh, ethics. And we don't know. The, once something goes on to the cloud, to the net, it can spread to anywhere and it, it stays there. It never gets deleted. You may delete it from your computer, but it's still on the, on the net. And so we have a real problem of patient confidentiality. And as of today, there is no government control. I must say that if you look at this Hickok AI task force 2018, that's from India. So India had a task force in 2018. I have gone through this huge document, no, though not completely. I have glanced through it. They had thought of all these problems. But even in India, there is no legislation to control AI. England, Rishi Sunak took the lead and two months ago had a conclave in the UK to discuss this. The European Union, the Americans, they're all discussing it. Still, we have no answer. So, as of now, I would be very, very wary of using AI-driven information for medical publishing. I'll stop here and uh, hopefully we'll have... We may not have time for discussion because we are on to. Uh, Lakshman, sir, uh, it's okay. You're closing here. I'm done. Thank yeah, you. yeah. As usual, Lakshman, sir, he's the authority. Whatever he talks, and uh, you must have seen the slides how to present a PPT, the natural intelligence talking about artificial intelligence, correct? Lakshman, sir, is natural intelligence. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> he's a gentleman of SSB. You must have seen each slide of his. None of the slide has got more than seven points. And the references below, it's perfect. The any presentation, and he is the authority, whatever he talks. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so you much. much. I think we'll go to the next, Sanya.